This is BBC One in the East Midlands. Now the news with Fiona Bruce and Colin Hazelden. A British man paralysed by a rugby accident ends his life at a Swiss clinic for assisted suicide. He was just 23. Dan James's parents say he had tried to kill himself several times before his former coach paid tribute tonight. He was a character. He was a real, real character. As a rugby player, he had tremendous potential. The tragic case has prompted new concerns about assisted suicide given Dan James's youth and that he wasn't suffering from a terminal illness. Also tonight, the British soldier who died in Afghanistan after the wrong helicopter was sent. A coroner says those responsible should hang their heads in shame. Dramatic eyewitness accounts of the desperate struggle to overcome the car bombers at Glasgow Airport. The US presidential candidates take time out for some rare moments of humor. I've dismissed my entire team of senior advisors. All of their positions will now be held by a man named Joe the Plumber. Contrary to the rumors that you've heard, I was not born in a manger. I was, I was actually born on Krypton and sent here to save the planet Earth. And India's most famous cricketer becomes the highest scoring batsman in the history of the game. Here in the East Midlands, the terminally ill become victims of the economic downturn as a hospice could be forced to close. And caring for your credit card as one set of website fraudsters are shut down. Good evening. Aged 22, Dan James was a promising rugby player until an accident during a scrum changed his life forever. Paralysed from the neck down, he repeatedly tried to take his own life. At 23 years old, he succeeded in a Swiss clinic for assisted suicide. Police are interviewing a man and a woman, believed to be Dan James's parents. Assisted suicide is illegal in the UK. The tragic case has prompted concerns as to whether someone so young and not suffering from a terminal illness should be able to end his life in this way. Here's our medical correspondent, Fergus Walsh. Dan James had been a talented rugby player and represented England as a teenager. But in an accident in March last year, his spine was crushed when a scrum collapsed during a training session. The damage left him paralysed from the neck down. The tragedy happened at Nuneaton Rugby Club, where friends tonight are mourning him. He was full of life and, and, and he enjoyed life, you know. It was a terrible accident and the Nuneaton Rugby Club, uh, uh, apart from his parents, have suffered a, a great player and a great loss. West Mercia Police said they'd interviewed a man and a woman thought to be Dan's parents, who've not said whether they helped him travel to Switzerland. In a statement, they said his death was an extremely sad loss, but a welcome relief from the prison he felt his body had become and the day-to-day -day fear and loathing of his living existence. He was an intelligent, strong-willed and some say determined young man. Over the last six months, he constantly expressed his wish to die and was determined to achieve this in some way. Based in Zurich, the organisation Dignitas has now helped around 100 Britons to die by supplying a lethal barbiturate drink. Oh, yes. Among them was Dr Anne Turner. She had a progressive brain disease and asked the BBC to film her final hours with her children to publicise her campaign to change the law in Britain. Her son believes this case went too far. I don't think that Dan James should have been allowed to take his own life under his circumstances in the UK. What I would like to see is assisted dying for the term ill made legal in this country, which would mean we'd be subject to a system of UK regulation which would have far tighter safeguards than currently exist in Switzerland. Yes. The Lord Jesus. But two years ago, the House of Lords rejected a bid to allow assisted suicide in England and Wales after concerted opposition. Assisted suicide is illegal because a law allowing it could so easily be exploited or abused because so many disabled or elderly people feel themselves to be a financial uh, or emotional burden and the right to die could so easily become the duty to die. Like Dan James, former airline pilot Chris Dan was paralysed from the neck down after a freak sports injury. 
He says his wife and children make life worth living, although early on he had talked about suicide. I'm OK. I get by every day and stuff like that. Obviously, I can't move and I need other people to help me. But uh, mental state-wise, I just, I'm on a computer. I can do most everything anybody else could do with their brain, if you like. Tonight, on Dan James's Facebook page, there were several tributes from friends. One said, Dan, you were a great bloke on and off the rugby pitch. Another said, he had a heart of gold and would be sadly missed. Now, Fergus, this case is particularly tragic given that Dan James was so young, just 23, and clearly unable to come to terms with his very severe disability. Yeah, it's very sad, Fiona. I think people will be surprised that this group Dignitas will accept people who are not terminally ill. Now, Switzerland has the most lax laws on suicide in the world. It's the only country that will allow foreign nationals to commit suicide there. Five years ago, a couple from Bedfordshire, Jennifer and Robert Stokes, who were not terminally ill, had a history of depression, had chronic illness. They died together in a Zurich flat run by Dignitas. And that has led to concerns from the Swiss authorities about this concept of suicide tourism. And next year, there's likely to be a referendum in Switzerland which could restrict this assisted suicide to the terminally ill and restrict it only to Swiss nationals. Okay, Fergus, thank you. The Ministry of Defence should hang their heads in shame over the lack of equipment and mistakes that led to the death of a soldier in Afghanistan, a coroner said today. Corporal Mark Wright was killed by a mine which exploded in the downdraft of the helicopter sent to rescue him. Our defence correspondent Caroline White is at the Ministry of Defence now. Caroline. Well, this has been a difficult day, not just for the family of Corporal Wright, who've had to hear the evidence at the inquest, but also a difficult verdict for the MOD, a bitter reminder of one of the most traumatic events of the early days in 2006 in Helmand province, when British troops first went in. This was a day on which Corporal Wright lost his life trying to save his colleagues in a minefield, but a day on which another, several other soldiers lost their limbs and many others were injured. Corporal Mark Wright, killed in Afghanistan by a landmine at the age of just 27. He was awarded a posthumous George Cross for going to the aid of his colleagues. Today, his family and many comrades came to the coroner's court. Among them, here on the left, Sergeant Stuart Pearson, who lost his leg in the same incident. They heard the coroner deliver a scathing verdict. Andrew Walker pointed up a series of failings and said those responsible should hang their heads in shame. Afterwards, the Wrights said they now had answers and some peace of mind, knowing their son had not contributed to his own death. It has been painful to listen to the catalogue of errors that led to Mark's death. However, the coroner has made recommendations that must be followed. Jem and I do not want any other families to experience the loss of their child. Corporal Wright was killed near the Kajaki Dam in Helmand in September 2006. A rescue team was sent in after one of Corporal Wright's comrades was injured in the first blast. Crucially, they hadn't been given a map warning them where the minefield was, although headquarters had one. Stuart Pearson was among the group. He radioed for an evacuation helicopter, saying, we need a winch, knowing a helicopter landing could be disastrous. This MOD video shown in court is of the kind of Chinook sent to get them out, but it didn't have a winch. It came in low and attempted to land before being warned off. Some witnesses claim the downdraft may have set off the mine, which fatally injured Corporal Wright. It was several hours before the team was rescued. The coroner, Andrew Walker, has sharply criticised the MOD at several previous inquests into military deaths. On the death of Sergeant Stephen Roberts, shot in Iraq, Mr Walker blamed the army for serious failings. On Lance Corporal Sean Tanzi, crushed while repairing a tank in Afghanistan, he said there was evidence of the failure to provide basic equipment. And he ruled that Captain James Philipson died in Afghanistan because of the Army's unforgivable and inexcusable failure to provide basic equipment. Corporal Wright's death came in the early days of Britain's deployment in Helmand Province, when the terrain and the fighting proved far more savage than expected, and resources were stretched to breaking point. The MOD says lessons have been learned. We've done a lot since. For example, 
we've got more helicopters in theatre than we had before. Um, we've got the Sea Kings there, as well as more Chinook. We've, we're flying more hours on the helicopters we've got. We've got better communications equipment. We've got our intelligence is better. But too late to save Corporal Wright. And others with loved ones still serving in Afghanistan will be asking themselves, has enough really changed since then? Well, the MOD has said that it will pay compensation to the men injured in that tragedy. But of course, the 8,000 men and women of the British Armed Forces out in Helmand Province are still facing many of those same dangers today. And indeed, an increased threat from some Taliban tactics learnt from the insurgency in Iraq. An increased threat of roadside bombs, of IEDs, of suicide bombing. That means they do need ever better, ever increasing protection in a conflict which some commanders warn is heading in the wrong direction. Caroline, thank you. The London Stock Exchange has ended the week positively, closing up by about 5% and above the 4,000 mark. It's been a nervous week for the FTSE 100, with traders dealing with near record falls and gains as they responded to fears of a global recession. The truce is over for David Cameron and Gordon Brown. While the Prime Minister has been praised at home and abroad for his bank rescue plans, Mr Cameron launched a stinging attack on Mr Brown's economic record today. He condemned what he called irresponsible policies, which had created an unsustainable boom. Here's our political editor, Nick Robinson. And I suppose for a superhero, he should have a cloak. The hailing by some of Gordon Brown as the superhero of the financial crisis is a gift to cartoonists like Gerald Scarf. It is, of course, rather less welcome for the Tory leader, who believes that history is being rewritten. have a large sort of pin, which he's hoping will deflate Brown. The intention. So today, David Cameron called off the political truce that began when he backed the Prime Minister's bank rescue package. It's time, he says, to focus on why that was needed. Gordon Brown is hoping that his whirlwind summitry will mean that we'll forget what has come before. Forget that as we enter a downturn, where jobs, homes and livelihoods will be lost, that he was the one who created this mess in the first place. But I won't forget, and the British people won't forget. This is an argument about who's to blame for the economic mess we're in. America, Gordon Brown, or both? The Tory leader said today that though there may be global problems, the failures of policy were national, both here and in the United States. The failure to regulate US subprime mortgages was an American failure. And the failure to regulate public and private debt in Britain was a British failure. But is he willing to give credit to the Prime Minister, as many others have done, for the way he handled this crisis? I found him rather reluctant to do so. I'm inviting you to give some credit to the Prime Minister. Oh, I look, I think the, re the recapitalisation of the banks... But on right. personal grounds, no, no, not I just the policies, no, right? Absolutely. He handled I, it well. I think he? that the recapitalisation of the banks was right. He's the Prime Minister who put that forward, and clearly everyone should, should have credit for that, no doubt about it. Him particularly, he handled this crisis well. I, I, don't, I wouldn't go as far as say that because I think that, to some extent, he was the cause of some of the crisis. Whilst Gordon Brown's ministers accused the Tories of playing party politics, the man himself wanted to look above the fray. I'm determined to work with everybody who wants to to make sure that we as a nation come through the difficult times caused by events outside our control in the world economy are dealt with. Gordon Brown always stresses that we face a global problem, presenting himself as part of the solution. Today, David Cameron said no, he's really part of the problem. we will put a few studs on his boot. That we might sharpen him up a bit. Nick Robinson, BBC News, Westminster. A court has heard dramatic accounts of the attempts made by passengers and staff to overcome a car bomber at Glasgow Airport. One man described how his leg was broken in the scuffle. Another, how he tried to overpower the suicide bomber with a fire extinguisher. Bilal Abdullah and another man, Mohammed Asher, deny conspiracy to murder and conspiracy to cause explosions. Andy Tai reports. Glasgow Airport on June the 30th last summer. And next to the terminal building on the right of the screen, a jeep is on fire. At the wheel is a terrorist suicide bomber and the vehicle is packed with canisters of gas and petrol. People begin to shout and scream and inside they hurry to get out of the way. These CCTV pictures show what happened. Today some of the people who were there described it. Off-duty policeman Stuart Ferguson said Kafil Ahmed, the driver, 
was completely engulfed in flame from head to toe. He lay down on his back and raised his arms in the air as if in prayer. Ahmed later died of his injuries. His passenger in the car, seen here in white, is allegedly Bilal Abdullah, one of the men on trial. It's claimed he threw Molotov cocktails and fought with people who tried to stop him, including a man whose leg was broken in the encounter, Michael Kerr, who said, I don't know if it was a kick from him or me kicking the man. It was just a clash. Another eyewitness claimed Abdullah pointed at the vehicle and shouted, there are bombs. Grabbing a fire extinguisher, airport worker Henry Lambie said, I thought he was going to have a go at me, so I hit him in the face with the jet of water. Later, PC James Craig told the jury how Bilal Abdullah, after he was arrested, tried to engage him in conversation, asking him if he was aware of the damage that Britain does to other countries. PC Craig didn't reply, but says Abdullah went on to say, yes, we are terrorists, but... He didn't complete that statement, said the officer. Andy Tai, BBC News, Woolwich Crown Court. The presidential elections now, and with 18 days to go, Barack Obama is ahead in the polls and John McCain is on the defensive. Mr Obama has changed his strategy. He's now campaigning in states no one thought he could win just a few months ago. Our North America editor, Justin Webb, has been to rural southwest Virginia to examine Obama's new path towards winning the presidency. This should be hostile territory for Barack Obama. Here in the foothills of the Appalachians, people tend to be conservative, suspicious of outsiders. <laughs> but they tend as well to be poor. In a trailer park in Roanoke, Virginia, Christopher and Jennifer Kuhn live with their 17-month-old daughter in conditions that are typically tough. The couple work, but wages are so low that they get food stamps. They have no health insurance. Until recently, they supported the Republican ticket. You would have voted for McCain if the economy hadn't gone the way it has? Yes. That's exactly it. Our, our thing is the economy right now. That's what changed our mind straight up was, was his economic plan, was, was actually McCain's failure to, to bring an economic plan that we would like. So Democrats hunting votes in these parts are going about their business with a renewed sense of purpose. This man is one of their leaders, an Appalachian through and through, a man who understands this place and feels it changing. Uh, you're in a Bible Belt, and it all goes back to, you know, God, guns, and gays. I, I think without question the economy right now is trumping cultural issues, and the way it's trump trumping it is in a different kind of way. Uh, uh, nobody's talking about guns. You know, nobody's talking about gays. Nobody's talking about, you know, the hate that has prevailed, you know, as a campaign strategy in the Republican Party. Capitalizing on that, the man himself was in town today. Rono, I know these are difficult times. The Democrats haven't won Virginia since 1964. Next month, powered by personal attention from the candidate, they have a real chance. Barack Obama is able to concentrate on an ambitious target like Virginia because in the other big battlegrounds he's already ahead. In Ohio, a must-win for Republicans, the Obama lead is around 3%. In Florida, it's 4%. And in Pennsylvania, the polls suggest a local landslide with Obama ahead by 14%. Back in Roanoke, when the main man can't get here, the big name backers come. Bill and Hillary Clinton are respected in these parts, and Hillary did well in the primaries, downplaying the old cultural issues, focusing on jobs and health. Exactly what Team Obama are doing now. They learn from the mistakes they made against Hillary Clinton. They have fought a clever campaign in the mountains, and it could pick up some really vital votes. Justin Way, BBC News, Roanoke, Virginia. Well, away from the campaigning, the two presidential candidates have been showing their lighter side. They were trading jokes at a white Thai charity dinner in New York, just 24 hours after their last televised debate. Senator McCain began by announcing a new recruit to his campaign team. I've dismissed my entire team of senior advisors. All of their positions will now be held by a man named Joe the Plumber. <laughs> This campaign needed the common touch of a working man. After all, it began so long ago with a heralded arrival of a man known to Oprah Winfrey as the one. Being a friend and colleague of Barack, I just called him 
that one. <laughs> he doesn't mind at all. In fact, he even has a pet name for me, George Bush. <laughs> Contrary to the rumors that you've heard, I was not born in a manger. I was, I was actually born on Krypton and sent here by my father, Jor-El, to save the planet Earth. Many of you know that I got my name, Barack, from my father. And I got my middle name from somebody who obviously didn't think I'd ever run for president. Obama's middle name is Hussein. BBC News has learnt that the government and the two laboratories in Surrey at the centre of last year's foot and mouth outbreak are to be sued by farmers whose businesses were affected. If the case is successful, it could lead to claims of more than £100 million. Zimbabwe's Prime Minister Morgan Changarai says he has failed to reach agreement with President Robert Mugabe on the composition of a power-sharing cabinet. The two leaders have been taking part in four days of talks on the new government. Mr Changarai has called for the African Union to intervene. The Indian cricketer Sachin Tendulkar has become the highest scoring test batsman in the history of the game. Playing on the first day of the second test against Australia in Mohali, the, he overtook the previous record of 11,953 runs held by the West Indian Brian Lara. Our sports editor Mihir Bose reports on a remarkable achievement. This was the moment Sachin Tendulkar became the most prolific test batsman of all time. Three runs of the very first ball after tee took him past Brian Lara's record. The Australians joined in the celebration, while the Indians, fireworks at the ready, exploded with joy to acclaim their hero, both a master batsman and an iconic Indian figure who seemed to take everything in his tries. I would have preferred to uh, get my record earlier, but uh, you know, it's 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 uh, nice that it's it's come at the right time. I mean, the Australians are are the top side, and uh, you know, to get against uh, them was a, was a special moment, and I treasure this. Joy was not confined to the stadium, as celebrations took place all over the country. It's not he deserves it. I think he was made for it. He's absolutely a legend, and now he's truly brought himself into the category of Don Bradman, Sunil Gavaskar, Brian Lara. It was in England at Old Trafford that Tendulkar made his mark on world cricket, scoring his first test century. Aged 17 years and 112 days. Not old enough to drive a car or drink, but mature enough to tame England's best. Since that momentous day on this ground, he has scored thousands more runs, charming us with his batting. His sheer class cannot be doubted, but for all the records he has set, the debate about whether he's the greatest batsman continues. Since then, he's gone past the greats of cricket, Don Bradman, by whose high standards all batsmen are now judged. And this morning, he surpassed Brian Lara, the other great of the modern era. Australian captain Ricky Ponting is hot on his heels, though, and probably has more years of cricket ahead of him than Tendulkar might. To, to try and rate them, I don't think you can. I think you've got to say that he certainly has got more runs than anybody at the moment, and without doubt he is probably in the top three of the all-time greats. It's always difficult to compare cricketers of different eras, but there can be no doubting that Tendulkar occupies a very special place in cricket's pantheon. If not the greatest, then close enough to be part of the very best in the game. Mihir Bose, BBC News. A new exhibition of photographs by Robert Kappa, arguably the world's greatest war photographer, opened today at the Barbican in London. Iconic images like the falling soldier, the moment Kappa's lens caught a man's death during the Spanish Civil War, are among his most memorable photos. Our arts correspondent Razi Iqbal has been looking at Kappa's work and comparing it with contemporary photojournalism. Robert Kappa was responsible for some of the most defining images of key moments in history. Arguably the world's greatest war photographer, he was a pioneer in the black and white art of war. And Kappa always got close, that was what mattered to him. He was present at the dramatic D-Day landings and sent back four rolls of film. The whole world was waiting for these pictures. The pressure to publish, though, led to disaster. A young lad burst into my office and said, they're all ruined, and sure enough, the first three rolls, there was nothing, it was just pea soup. 
But on the fourth roll, there were 11 printable pictures, and here they are. This exhibition attempts to lay to rest controversy surrounding Kappa's most famous picture from the Spanish Civil War, a loyalist soldier captured on camera at the moment of his death. Critics argue it was staged, but the series here shows that the most that could be said was that this picture was a fluke which went on to become emblematic. During the era when Robert Kappa took these photographs, their impact in magazines, sometimes days or even weeks later, was powerful. These days, with endless 24-hour news channels, what kind of power does the still image hold? Stop and stare portraits of the men and women from the 52 Brigade in Helmand province, taken by the commercial photographer Robert Wilson. He went to Afghanistan as a war artist, not a photojournalist. As we become increasingly familiar with footage from war zones, there's a sense that we've seen all there is to see about conflict. Can there be any potency left in looking at a photograph? It's always the eyes that pulls you in. These guys, there's, there's no doubting whether the pictures are authentic or whether they've been staged or just because you look at them and the, the exhaustion's there to see. Um, and I think the eyes always give it away. Because of Kappa, we all think we know what war looks like. For him, the impossibility of capturing it forced him and countless others to never stop trying. Razia Iqbal, BBC News. Well, there's more on the BBC News channel. But now we can join our news teams where you are. Bye-bye. This is the news for the East Midlands. I'm Colin Hazel and a very good evening to you. First tonight, the terminally ill people who say they fear being left as prisoners in their own homes after a hospice warned it might close. The Nottinghamshire Hospice provides support for thousands of people each year, but a drop in donations because of the credit crunch and failed investments on the stock market have hit their finances hard. Carolyn Moses reports. Its motto is adding life to days. But the last few days for the Nottinghamshire Hospice has seen the life squeezed out of its finances. It costs almost two and a half million pounds a year to run. More than 90 staff are involved, but it's lost 200,000 pounds in donations and sponsorship. And now the stock market's pushed it to the brink. Well, this is a chart showing the FTSE 100 index, the fortunes of the London shares. And in a way, it mirrors what's been happening for the fortunes of the hospice. Over the last few months, the credit crunch has hit donations and there are wobbles here. But look at the crash of October. £65,000 of hospice investments simply wiped off. Without any further funds, the hospice will inevitably have to cut back its services drastically and in the end won't be able to survive and we need to be here for our patients at the end of their life. Some of them don't have anywhere else to go at all. It mustn't be allowed to close. Definitely not. Well, I think I would become a recluse at home because, you know, I'm fetched here, taken home, given meals. And where else is there? I would literally be shattered. It just doesn't bear thinking about it. And the hospice is fighting back with last-ditch fundraising, its Hospice Hopes campaign. It's moved what money it has left out of the stock market and it's hoping that those most in need will still get a taste of the care it has to offer before it's too late. Carolyn Moses, East Midlands Today, Nottinghamshire. While well, staying with finance, the Prime Minister Gordon Brown was in the region today meeting local business leaders and offering reassurances over jobs. He was addressing the first meeting of the new economic cabinet for the East Midlands. It's made of politicians and business leaders. Recent figures suggest that the unemployment rate in the East Midlands is one of the highest in the country. Now, a website used by criminals to swap credit card details has been closed down after a major international police operation. Almost 60 people have been arrested in Britain, including one person from Leicester. So, how safe are our credit cards and what can we do to make them more secure? Here's Helen Astle. We all love using our credit cards and many of us have bought into the buy now, pay later culture. But how safe are we when we're using our flexible friends? Credit card fraud is still a huge problem. In the first half of this year, we saw a 50% increase in the number of fraud victims coming to Experian for help. These people are often worried, they're, they're frustrated, they're distressed. So certainly it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem, something we all need to be aware of. So what can we do to make our credit cards more secure? 
keep your PIN number secret. Always check your credit card statement. And destroy all your statements. I think we should be concerned in the run-up to Christmas because identity fraud could well increase because of the pressure on household finances, which of course affect fraudsters too, because of uh, many lenders tightening their, their lending policies. So fraudsters are going to have to revert to ever more clever ways of getting hold of our information. So we really do need to be vigilant. It's estimated that one in four of us is likely to become a victim of credit card fraud. So make sure you're safe and secure while you spend. Helen Astle, East Midlands Today, Nottingham. Neighbours are trying to find a good Samaritan who rescued a mother from her burning house. The fire broke out on Shipley Road in Broxtow last night, trapping the woman and her children. The children were later rescued by fire crews. None of the family required hospital treatment. Neighbours have praised the mystery passerby who raised the alarm. I've come out, got my ladders, like, tried to get over the road as quick as I could, and I seen, I seen a gentleman walking up the road, and... He just helped me, you know, him. he went up the ladders, I the ladders for him. One kid was already out with mum. She was telling the people that there's three more kids inside. And then about 20 minutes later, the poor three kids out. It was all right, though. A new online football hooligan game has been condemned as absolutely outrageous by Nottingham Forest Football Club. The game, Little Hooligans, encourages players to join virtual gangs, to beat up supporters of other teams and even to mug pensioners. Well, Forest is one of 30 big city clubs to have an online gang. The company behind the site insists it won't encourage people to become hooligans in real life. Well, sport now and the Leicester Tigers fly half. Toby Flood says he's got his sights set on securing his England future. Tomorrow though, Flood and his Tigers teammates are concentrating on maintaining their form in the Heineken Cup. Here's Angela Rafferty. Can I kick it? Flood has really found his feet at Leicester. He spent a long time in the shadow of his Newcastle teammate Johnny Wilkinson. Now the 23-year-old is ready to take centre stage. It's the type of club that you need to make a name for yourself, I guess, and, and, and earn your stripes. You know, there's a lot of top quality players here and it's, that in itself is really exciting. His boot helped secure Tigers' win in the opener of their Heineken Cup campaign. But this understated fly-half isn't getting carried away, with talk of him taking the number 10 shirt for England. When you have the likes of Johnny and Danny Cipriani around, there's a lot of press and media interest. And to be honest, I'm just keeping my head down here. And, and if things go well here and, and England comes in, fantastic. At the moment, it's paramount that I play well for, for Leicester because they're the club who pay my wages and they're the team I want to impress. So no fanfare from Flood. Instead, he'll let his rugby do the talking at Treviso this weekend to help ensure England don't leave him overlooked. Angela Rafferty, East Midlands Today. Just finally, congratulations, big congratulations to BBC Radio Nottingham. Last night, the station, which has been broadcasting for 40 years, was named as BBC Local Radio Station of the Year. Brilliant stuff. Now then, let's take a quick look at the weather across the East Midlands as we go into the weekend. Here's Des. Well, I can tell you something now. We aren't going to do too badly as we head towards the weekend. Tonight, we're going to get some late summer sunshine, clouding over slightly, stopping temperatures dip down too low. Actually, temperatures dip to around 8 degrees, so it's a mild night tonight, much warmer than what we experienced last night. The winds are quite gentle as well. They pick up a little bit once we get into Saturday, and we see some sunshine coming through. Just a touch of rain towards the northwest. It shouldn't really affect us. Temperatures rising nicely up to 15 degrees. Take care yourselves. Now, tonight's news night is starting over on BBC Two about now. Do join Gavin Esler if you can. From all of us on the East Midlands Today team, though, good night to you. Hello again. I think you'll be chasing those autumn leaves around this weekend as the winds pick up, particularly on Sunday. So Saturday possibly the better day of the weekend for most of us. It will be fairly breezy, especially across northern areas, but there will be some bright or sunny spells around as well. A bit more cloud around during tonight, but let's just give you a sneak preview of Sunday's weather. There it is, a deepening area of low pressure waiting out in the Atlantic, bringing the first autumn gales to many areas, I think, during Sunday. But ahead of all that, as I say, a bit more cloud tonight, so it won't be quite as chilly for most of us. The cloud producing some outbreaks of rain at the moment across northern England. That'll slowly ease away, but followed on by some more rain into Scotland and Northern Ireland. One or two heavier bursts 
particularly over western hills. But generally not as cold tonight, 7, 8, 9 degrees typically, maybe down to 6 across East Anglia and some southern parts of England, where at least it will be a bright start to the day tomorrow. Let's just pick up on this weather front, though, that's going to be easing its way slowly southwards. Behind that, things should brighten up across Scotland and Northern Ireland, but the front's going to become slow moving across Northern England by the afternoon. So that's going to be the focus for rather cloudier skies. A bit disappointing, I think, for the Lake District down through the shower somewhere. But if you see one of those, I think you're going to be very unlucky. Much of Wales dry too, but North Wales, it's that front again. It's going to keep a bit of rain going into the afternoon. But as I mentioned, Scotland, Northern Ireland, a drier, brighter afternoon, but a fairly breezy one. And you'll really notice that breeze picking up, I think, during Saturday night. Because here it comes, that low I mentioned earlier, steaming in from the Atlantic, deepening all the while. The main centre staying away towards the northwest, but it's close enough to bring gales in across much of Scotland, Northern Ireland, into the Irish Sea during the day on Sunday. Heavy rain too, maybe severe gales eventually across the far northwest. Ahead of that, yes, a breezy day, but at least we'll get some sunshine, particularly across southeastern parts of England. Highs here of around 14 to 16 degrees. So things going downhill, I think, as the weekend goes on, turning rather more unsettled as autumn gales heading in. So if you feel like uh, staying indoors instead, you can always catch the autumn edition of The Weather Show. That'll be on the news channel through this coming weekend. Or you can also catch it on the BBC iPlayer. That's all from me. Bye-bye.